Okay, welcome everybody. What you just saw was a time lapse from our uh, Roadshow Heavy programs, our in-person shows that we did all over North America pre-COVID. Uh, but we are happy to be back in 2021 with Roadshow Light. We've had a lot of success with this program, bringing uh, the HDPE message directly to you in your home or office. So as you know, today we're going into the Data Logger 7. Mike Pacheco from McElroy Manufacturing is here with us to uh, go in depth on uh, what we think is a great topic and a great resource uh, for HDPE users uh, across the country. As always, we wanna thank Alliance members. Uh, their membership makes what we do possible. Uh, these are the companies you wanna support. If you want the best HDPE products available, these are the companies from whom you would like to purchase. Uh, special thanks to United Poly Systems. They're sponsoring this show today. Um, Peter, is Tom Titus on the line? Uh, I haven't seen him, um, but you made him a panelist, right? Yeah. So if he turns his video on, um, we'll connect with him. But if he's not here, let's keep moving. But acknowledge uh, how thankful we are that um, United Poly Systems has sponsored this event, right? Yeah, if you'd like to join the Alliance, uh, you can do so on the website pepipe.org. If you are an engineer or a contractor, there is no fee to join. Uh, if you're a manufacturer, there's a small fee and we can discuss that with you if you are interested. Um, follow us on social media. We're active on these three platforms as well as Instagram. We're posting every day. By far, our most activity, as you may expect, is on LinkedIn, but follow us on the platform of your choice. Also on the website, pepipe.org, is a great case study database. This is searchable by project type, by geographical location. So if you are considering a poly project in your municipality, chances are you can find a case study of someone who's done something similar in close proximity to you. Uh, if you'd like, if you have a case you'd like to see published in our database, uh, feel free to reach out. We have a simple form we need you to fill out and we have interns that can write the case study for you. We have a few more Roadshow Light programs on the schedule right now. Next week, our standard HDPE 101 and 301 programs. 101 is the basic features and benefits of polyethylene. That's for the new user. Uh, 301 is what we call an engineer's view really goes in depth on uh, polyethylene specific design considerations. March 10th, we have a new program, HDPE Above Ground. Uh, we put this together because pretty much every webinar we've produced over the past year, we've gotten questions about uh, above ground installation, restraint, things of that nature. So we've put together a full presentation on that topic with case studies. We're pretty excited about, uh, about what we have to present for you. And then finally, March 17th, we're going back to McElroy uh, to highlight some of their butt fusion equipment. We'll be doing some demos. We'll be taking a look at some of their uh, productivity equipment as well. Uh, but live uh, at McElroy, demoing machines, manual machines, uh, hydraulic machines, track machines. We're going to take a look at just about everything they have down there. All these shows are at 2 p.m. Eastern, and you can register on the website pepipe.org. We offer an engineer's package. Uh, I know the date says 2020. We haven't updated it for 2021 yet, but that will be happening soon. You can email me at dmuller at pepipe to request um, a copy. This is a great collection of uh, specifications, design guidelines. The book, the Plastic Pipe Institute's Handbook of PE Pipe is part of that package, as well as the Alliance's uh, collection of standard details and model specifications, which you can copy and paste into your own municipal uh, spec and details. We also like love to plug the Poly Podcast. We've been doing podcasts for about six months now, Peter. Does that sound right? Yeah, maybe seven. Okay, and we've produced how many? Gosh, I think we're at like 18. Mm -hmm. So these are on Apple Podcasts, whatever application you use to listen to your podcast, you can find us talking to uh, engineers and other important figures in the HDPE industry. It's been pretty exciting and a lot of fun. 
But now, Peter, do you want to go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker today? Yeah, so uh, good job, Drew, thanks. Um, who knows what happened with that audio? Um, if anyone's still having audio, please send us another chat. Thank you for doing that. Mike Pacheco, come on board here. So Mike is the innovation product manager at McElroy. Uh, he's responsible for the, all of McElroy's digital products, like the data logger, which he's going to talk about today, the vault, uh, the app, uh, McElroy's inspection app. Didn't know you guys had an inspection app. That sounds pretty exciting, Mike. Um, so welcome, Mike. It's great to see you again. Yeah, thank you, Peter. We're glad to, glad to be here for sure. Yeah, and people are looking forward to this. You know, Mike, we added 15 minutes to this. You know, I, I know you like to hog the spotlight, but we gave you an extra 15 minutes because, you know, you've done this before and 60 minutes just didn't seem like enough. And, you know, you wanted to bring Jesse in and talk a little bit more about what's going on in the field. Tell us a little bit about that and please introduce Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll take uh, all the time we can get for sure. So yeah, this is uh, Jesse Smith. I thought it'd be great to bring him on, really change the program from what we've done previously. Uh, Jesse is uh, McElroy's training coordinator. So he's trained thousands of operators in the field. So he has this great perspective of what it really takes to put on a training program and deliver it. Um, but it is a little bit more than that. He's also, uh, you know, who we send out on a lot of job sites for assistance and and even on-site uh, uh, trainings and things like that. Right. Um, so he's been around. He's going to bring just a great perspective, and he's going to also do some of the walkthrough on this, and we'll have more more of a conversation through it. So. Well, Jesse and I got to know each other um, in Seattle last fall, you know, during COVID. And Jesse, you told me an awful lot about this project in Alaska. Please tell our audience a little bit about it. Sure, thanks, Peter. Um, this was a really unique project, uh, unique enough that it's won several awards within the industry. Uh, myself and several other folks from McElroy, McElroy University team, uh, were all able to go out and spend, um, I, gosh, I think we were out there for a total of about four months between about uh, six or eight different people. Um, this was obviously the, the Talon, uh, our largest fusion machine. And this is the Battle Creek Diversion Project. And we fused um, around 2,000 feet of uh, 63 inch poly to run uh, water from a, a newly built diversion dam down into a lake that had been uh, water level depleted uh, due to melting glaciers and things like that, uh, that uh, needed extra water to run across a hydroelectric dam. Right, um, very cool. We we were able to do that in, in a, with the Talon in a way that no other fusion machine or piece of equipment would have been able to do that. With data log the entire project, that process really saved us a couple of times there, which we'll talk about more here in just a few minutes. But. So did you hire that inspector on the image on the right, or did he uh, just the, kind of show up and ask for a job? The inspector was a real bear. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was a daily occurrence. The bears were uh, not shy about coming up to see what was going on. So I actually took that picture um, and that's, those are 80 foot sticks of pipe. So that bears about 80 feet away from me. Yeah, very cool. Well, what a great project. You know, the Alliance gave that project an award, Jesse, and uh, it was really great for me to learn about that project from you. So thanks for sharing. Um, but speaking of Alaska, you know, you guys in uh, Tulsa down there, you have kind of some Alaska weather going on, don't you? That is true. We're, chilly. we're dealing with it the last week or so. So they, they've got that weather going on down in Texas. So a shout out to our friends on the call today who are in Texas and experiencing this, this terrible um, uh, conflagration of multiple events happening simultaneously. And, you know, what does it have to do with us? Well, some of those issues that are occurring have to do with water main breaks. And colleagues in the industry have been giving me a hard time for years about, Peter, why do you spend so much time talking about the seismic performance of polyethylene. Well, this is precisely the reason. So here is a city councilman from Fort Worth. Uh, and this guy just posted this on Facebook yesterday. And he said, we've had 146 water main breaks. That was just on his side of Fort Worth. Uh, and you've got 26 crews working. And imagine the level of disservice to his constituents. The reason polyethylene is the pipe for this kind of condition is because when that ground moves, it bends with the ground. It doesn't fail at the joint. And you guys in Tulsa have been having your own issues, haven't you? So uh, because you've had so many issues with main breaks over the years, you guys have a uh, website just for water main breaks. And I took a minute this morning, Mike and Jesse, 
to uh, put together over the last six days how many water main breaks you've had in town. And your weather has been really pretty awful. But as you got closer to zero, you bumped up to 43 a day, to 50 a day, to 40 a day. And over on the right-hand side of this image, you can see um, when it was resolved. So, you know, about half, this was as of about two hours ago, half of the ones on this page have been resolved from the 17th and 18th. Polyethylene does not fail when the ground moves. In fact, it moves with the ground. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I got a couple hundred people on this call and, you know, I'm kind of like a politician. Why waste a good catastrophe? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how our product helps with that issue. And I would love it if Tulsa and Fort Worth would engage with us to a higher level and use more polyethylene because they won't see this sort of thing happen with our product. Sorry to take some of your time, Mike. I turn it over to you, my friend. All right. Yeah, no, appreciate it. It's an important, important message. Well, we appreciate everybody taking the time uh, to join us today. And, and we're, we're really excited. This is a great opportunity. So it is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be, uh, I'm going to jump into a little PowerPoint and, and run through a, a little slide deck here. And then when we come out of that slide deck, then we got a fusion machine set up. We're actually going to do a little walkthrough. And this is going to be more conversational, Jesse and I discussing um, all those features that exist in the Data Logger 7 and, and really talk about the practical application of the Data Logger. And I would say this is just edging on getting into a deep dive. So um, hopefully we cover enough high level, but I do, there are a lot of important details here we do want to cover. So I'm going to jump in real quick and let's get get into it and I'm going to share a slide with you. Peter, let me know if that is uh, satisfactory there. Yeah, it looks okay. good, Mike. All right. Thank you, Drew. So uh, get started. Yep. Yeah, Data Logger 7 and the Vault. And we'll really talk about, uh, go back uh, history wise and talk about where, how did we get here? So this little video of playing, we've been in data logging for over 26 years. So we are not new to this. This isn't a new product per se, aside from uh, of the new uh, technology that we have. Um, and built on that original legacy back when we were, had those, those Trimble brick devices, uh, we released in 2017, the Data Logger 6. The Data Logger 6 launched us into just a completely new era for recording fusion information. And it has honestly been the most successful device um, to date now up until the Data Logger. But that really wasn't just McElroy's success. That's not how we were approaching it. That's really because of everybody in the industry. So McElroy channel partners, end users, folks like the PE Alliance who are willing to do presentations and really get the message out about why this is important. Um, but honestly, those end users, uh, folks like you on the call who not only have adopted it, but you've actually taken the time to integrate to your business. So let's talk about how we really got here and what you're getting. So first thing I start off with just this basic concept of value. And um, so in conjunction with a great user experience that you get, this product must have value to the organization. And we understand that. So as a, a tool, any tool you're gonna purchase, it's gonna require investment, but that doesn't mean just in capital, right? It really means, especially the time that it takes to integrate this into your business. That's where the, the really needs to come in. That's where your investment really happens. And so we have sought out to provide more and more features that are going to add to this device and this platform's utility and thus add more value to your business. So we believe the Data Logger 6, moving to a larger screen, it really fundamentally just changed that value proposition. So I'm going to tell you about a few of those key features that I believe are, are really most impactful. And that first feature is a really simple, easy to use interface and something that we call guided workflow. So being able to guide the operator step-by-step step through not only the logging process of pipe fusion, but it's also assisting them with the overall fusion process and keeping consistency. We'll talk more about that, especially yes. with Jesse's uh, experience uh, is great with that. 
<clears throat> but you also have, and there's areas where we train on so much, we have built in video tutorials that walk you through really the two most critical points are measuring the drag properly and the shift sequence during the fusion process. There's built in video tutorials that you can pull up right on the device, see right there in field. And we believe that is really important uh, for operators, especially new operators or somebody who maybe doesn't do this all the time to be able to have that right at their fingertips. And then beyond that, the ability to have live pressure feedback. So this gives that operator, instead of we're not just looking at a gauge anymore, we're actually looking at the screen and you have that whole live feedback. Once you've learned that graph, once you've learned that curve, it tells you really all you, you really need to know about that you're performing those operations uh, correctly. There's obviously more to it, we'll talk more about that, but that is key and that has really taken hold with operators uh, out in the field. So we gather all of these things and then by the nature that we're using a, an Android device in this case, um, being able to take this display and cast it to a monitor. And, and like you see on this image here, this is a training center. This is national fuel, uh, natural gas uh, utility up in upstate New York. And this is their training facility. They went out and bought a, a really inexpensive monitor that they can cast to. These are all training data loggers. And one uh, trainer can stand back, see exactly what's going on. You can see here, they're, they're discussing that graph and how important that is. So uh, this, what it really led to us is that what we've really changed here is not just a data logger collecting infield data. What we're really doing is providing a fantastic training tool. And we know the challenges that our industry faces, uh, really any technical trade is, is acquiring and developing uh, new skilled labor in our workforces. So we focus on training. We're standing here outside of McElroy University. We have uh, uh, Jesse with us to talk more about that, but the Data Logger 6 has really become the tool, and now the Data Logger 7, to build repeatability and consistency into the process for both new and even experienced operators. But we are here and we do wanna tell you when, okay, that's kind of the high level, just something to really sink into. But let's talk about the, the data logger itself. Um, and we wanna talk about it. We have something new. So that is the data logger seven we released back in September. Uh, it's been a really exciting release. Uh, the actual release was well, uh, when the curve was much better than even the data logger six. So it, out, it eclipsed that. And the Data Logger 6 was on the market uh, for a little almost three years. And in the world of technology, that is a lifetime. And so we know our industry and we plan for a longer life cycle. But because technology changes, we wanna take advantage of those, uh, those, those key features that come out. And so there's a few things on the Data Logger 7 that I do wanna mention. And that is notably battery technology, and processing power, and then something that we've done is some really exciting development work with our new I series of track stars. And I'll talk to you all about that. I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. Um, but that led us to shift to a new device. So this is something, it's, it's a different product than the Data Logger 6. We're running the same software. So that's something to keep in mind. But we stuck with that same seven inch tablet form factor that works so well with the Data Logger 6. Um, another benefit with this is it's actually um, manufactured here in the US, which really helps us and allows us to ensure a robust supply chain and service channel. So really excited about that. But talk more, let's dive in more into the hardware. Um, and this has really been a great device for us to build upon. And we know the, oper the, the environments that we operate in. Um, these are just like weather we are having here in Tulsa where we have 40 degree swings in temperature in one day, we are one point up to negative 15. It feels balmy today and it's like 26 degrees outside. And these, these units are out there working. And so this environment is never kind to these devices. And so you're going from these extremely cold to these hot environments, you know, you talk about what's what's going down in Texas, everything that they're dealing with. I think we're supposed to be 75 degrees on Monday is what they're predicting. So we know that's going on and they are out there fixing water main breaks, you know? So 
Uh, but these are true construction job sites. And what we want is just like all of our equipment, we want robust hardware. And that's what we've chosen. This is not a consumer. This isn't an iPad. This isn't just some standard tablet. It is rugged. It is reliable, just like our, our fusion equipment. Uh, this data logger is IP68 rated. So that's the water dust ingress, which, and then we have the drop. So the shock proof, it's mill standard 810G. So let me say that differently. So it is waterproof, it is dust proof, and it is shock proof. And when we say it's a rugged device, we mean it. I hope you saw that video playing on the screen. That's the kind of torture test we're talking about is real torture, torture test. So uh, talk about a couple of other really important features. Hey, Mike, you know, you yes, know when uh, Elon Musk did that demo with his, with, I don't know if it was the truck or was one of his vehicles that he was excited about, he hit it with a hammer. And I heard him on Rogan last week talking about that where when, when they finally had the cameras rolling, it actually ended up breaking the window and he was yeah. incredibly embarrassed. So uh, how, Jesse, how do we know that that, uh, that tablet really is as rugged as uh, Mike likes to say. Uh, well, you know, we've had what three years with Data Logger Six, yep. and now going on what are we at six months or so with Data Logger Seven, and these things have been field tested as hard as we can field test them, you know, on top of what uh, the supplier tests as well. So these have already been out on on multiple job sites and put to the test in the most extreme environments that we can come up with. Yeah. Now, if you're asking me to take this and drop it on the floor, I would do that, but you're gonna lose all the feed from this data logger if we do that. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want you to do that. Uh, <laughs> I'm just excited about it because I, I know what kind of condition those McElroy fusion machines are sent back to you in and in, in your channel partners, they get them back on rental. So I can't imagine what these data, data loggers look like that have been out on rental too. I mean, I'm sure they get abused. They absolutely do. And, and you're right. We, the field testing that we did uh, before releasing the seven, I mean, we did multiple rounds of field testing with, with real operators. They still have them today and they will continue to have them uh, to do long-term tests for us. So they've been out running thousands upon thousands and you're actually going to see it as I'm going to actually pull up a vault account later and talk about it. But yeah, lots of rounds, the, the manufacturer of the tablet themselves, uh, the work they do, that was a video of them, uh, you know, you throwing in the creek, that's real. That isn't some, you know, manufactured up video. Um, that's, that's really right. happening. We so one of our, one of our guests, sorry, one of our guests just said, Hey, why don't you put it on the track of an excavator and walk away for a minute? Ha ha. Uh, tell us about the warranty is the yeah. question. Yeah, Jesse was yeah. just bringing it up. So it, this is a premium product. We get that. We know our place in the market. But along with that, you are also going to get a premium warranty. So that was very important to us when we were going out to spec a new device was it had to carry a fantastic warranty. So like our data logger six, the Data Logger 7 has a three year bumper to bumper warranty from the manufacturer. And that we mean bumper to bumper. So you break a screen, you send it in, we replace it, we send it back to you within that three years. You run over it with that track. And you know, years ago, I used to think that was a funny joke and it is not a funny, that absolutely happens. It falls off the cradle, does whatever and gets ran over. Scrape up those pieces, send it back and you will get a new device. So what other device is going, what, what other, you know, unit is going to do something like that? We, we stand behind it and we mean it. We know it's rugged. We know you need to be running. And when you invest in this product, you're going to get a warranty like that. So, yeah, very good. Yeah, okay. yeah very cool. Thank you for the that. confidence that, that, uh, that we have and that the manufacturer of the tablet has behind it. Right. Yeah. So diving diving back in uh, yeah aside uh, its ruggedness but what you're also getting and something that we're seeing in this mobile device space is uh i want to run more and all you know operators i'm sure as, as as many people on this call already use type infield type devices and you have applications business applications that you want to run well now people and more and more are looking for you know laptop desktop replacements with this when they go out to the field so what's having to happen is that we're having to throw more processing power at these and so that's what this is it's the latest greatest processing can handle anything we can throw out that was really important 
when we talk about that value add that we've been discussing is because that's the feedback we've gotten from our users. Hey, can I run this additional application? Can I run this one? And so the matter of fact, the original, uh, one of the original uh, infield testers was a company Fusion Technologies, one of the premium fusion contractors in the, in the US. And they run 11 different business applications. This is given to each operator and they're out in their technician, they're out in the field, they do, they do all their Zoom calls, they do all of their uh, uh, DOT logging and, and all kinds of time tracking, everything they have, but 11 different applications that they're running all this simultaneously with the data logger application. And that's what they're looking for. So we're giving you tons of processing power. It's, it's Android 9, so that's, the, that's the, the latest industrial version of Android um, that we're running. And that also brings one more feature that I think is important, just some, a little redundancy here, is you can now take advantage of the Google Find My Device um, feature. So, and that's all built in. So let's say uh, the device gets lost, it gets misplaced, somebody thought that they needed it more than you, you can use this feature to go in, you can find it, you can lock it, or even just erase it and get that data off of there. Um, so uh, there's a few key requirements. You do need to be connected to either a mobile data or a Wi-Fi network. So that's actually another great reason to have a SIM card. These are SIM card capable. So have that SIM card in there, and then you're gonna be able to take advantage of all these uh, features. So uh, pretty important there. So diving through. Um, also, battery life. So something the Data Logger 6, we go to a bigger screen, it consumes more battery. So a Data Logger 6, you can get about eight hours on, right? Well, what happens now, we have jobs that are running 11, 12 hours plus. Um, you need a device that can last that long. So we really sought out to deliver that. We believe we've delivered just best in class uh, battery performance with this. So what happens is, is that there's a built in 21 watt hour battery that's built into the device, but there's also a removable 43 watt hour battery. And the real job site performance, that's running those 11 different applications, running the data logger uh, full time, screen on, Wi-Fi, cellular, all those things going. And we are seeing 14 plus hours usage. And now though, because of that internal battery, something you have the ability to do is now you can actually hot swap that battery. So you can have another battery going, being you know, on a charger, ready to go. And when you need that additional battery life, you pop in that new battery. That's an additional kit you can buy on top to have that additional battery and charger. Um, but it gives you that full uh, all day use, essentially endless battery life. So pretty important there. This is huge for operators in the field. Don't have to worry about, about battery maintenance and, and when yeah. to charge and forgetting to charge at night. This is a huge convenience factor. Absolutely. So, uh, and, and going a little bit deeper here, um, we also included some new connectors. So this is just important for us. This is a, uh, it comes, it's obviously a military spec connector that has now moved into the industrial space and we are taking advantage of it. Um, why that is important um, is the cycles. So the old DB9 connector that we had on the data logger six, five, four, threes even, um, has a interesting rating of about a hundred cycles. That means a hundred times to plug it in, a hundred times to take it out. And we know that it lasts much longer than that, but just as an example of the difference, this new connector has up to 5,000 cycles. So just the, we ex expect a much more extended uh, life out of that. And it too is IP68 rating um, for water and dust ingress. So we expect that's at least three and a half years. That's a daily usage. So um, you're going to get a lot more out of it. And then we have a new transducer. So this is the part that's actually doing the work, sending the data to the uh, to the data logger. So you can see the the old call it transducer of the data logger six and the fives, and then the new uh, data logger seven is on that left, and it's just a much smaller form factor and but it has an automotive style sealed connector and it is a it is a, a great industrial unit that um that is, is is can based i'll tell you more about that and it's highly accurate it's rugged um and so we're really excited about um putting that out into the field and there's a reason that we went to can you'll hear me say that 
And that's because of our new TrackStar I-Series uh, machines. So and that come in a, in a 630 size, a 900, and a 1200. So large diameter machines for us. The reason I'm gonna mention that here is because that's what sets the Data Logger 7 um, apart, is it actually has capability of what you're gonna to see today to be run in this standalone operation. So you hear me say standalone Data Logger. That means when it's connecting to our legacy equipment. But this Data Logger can also seamlessly move over to our i-series equipment. So in this case, on the screen I'm showing, I've, I've got, I'm hooked up to a rolling 28 machine, but then whenever I need to, if I had to, and I had an i-series machine, that data logger can actually fully function on that i-series track star. So, and, and we've done that through um, de a development of boards so that's able to talk to, to both the transducer or talk to the i-series machine. And, and briefly, I'll mention what the I-Series is, is just, it is the built on that legacy of the track stars that we have today. The I-Series line that we just released in September takes this operator experience just to a completely new level. So it now comes with an integrated Data Logger 7. So the Data Logger 7 platform is integrated into the TrackStar and actually talking to the machine. So that allows us to, to dive deeper into that fusion process, create more automation. We actually have three different levels of control from, from manual to a more of a guided operation to a fully automatic fusion, which is absolutely going to just change um, our industry. So it's proven technology very rugged equipment. We're excited to get that out there. And the data logger is a key piece in that. So, so briefly to kind of wrap that section up, just remember you're getting a rugged tablet, Android powered, IP68 rated. So water, dust, shock proof. You get that great three-year bumper to bumper warranty. You got an all day battery life. You got cameras to capture those, those job site conditions and then uh, communication. So SIM capable, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, um, all capable. And then the most important part is that you have an easy to use, easy to understand interface that makes the folks in, on the ground, in the field, uh, uh, makes their day a lot easier. So that is the Data Logger 7. But now the reason I have Jesse here is, is let's, we're gonna jump out and we're gonna actually walk through a fusion, actually show you and talk about the features that exist in that Data Logger. So I'm gonna stop my share. You mean you're gonna let me talk? I'm gonna let you talk, yeah. Okay. Uh, while you're transferring, it looked like our screen's up here. So I wanna go over the equipment that we have in front of us. Uh, this. Fusion machine that I have here might not look familiar to some of you. This is an Acrobat 180. It's a smaller, more portable piece of fusion equipment. Um, works the same way as our traditional equipment, if you will, that you may be used to. Just works a little bit better for doing demonstrations, it's quieter, things of that nature. So we've got our Data Logger 7 hooked up to this HPU. We've got my fusion carriage with some, some four inch IPS uh, DR17 pipe. Um, Specifically on the data logger, what we have, we have our data logger tablet and it's plugged into a couple different things here. So I'm gonna carefully take it out of its mount and show you. Um, this is what we have with the tablet. And on the back, our cable is plugged in. Mike showed you that connector. This is what that looks like on the back of that tablet. And I'm going down to my pressure transducer and that may be just out of the bottom of the screen, but it's taken right or plugged right into that HPU. This is gonna to connect to all the fusion equipment that you have in your fleet the same way that previous data loggers have. It just looks a little bit different. Okay, now this white cable that's coming out of the data logger is there to provide you the uh, on-screen entertainment. So that's not something that would be necessary in the field. It's just getting us uh, to where we can cast this screen. Okay, so um, do you wanna go ahead and switch the screen over to the, to the oh, data logger and we'll start talking about what that looks like. So Mike's gonna share the screen and what he's sharing now is exactly what's on the data logger in front of me. So um, just wanna go over this screen. This is your home screen with the data logger seven. A few things going on here. Um, right in your face, you see this big start button, reports and settings. So if I wanna start a fusion process, I'm gonna hit the start button. That's pretty intuitive. Okay, with reports and settings, there's some things we can do in the background to help decide what we want to happen 
throughout the fusion process for the operator and also what's gonna happen with the information that we're logging and that we're capturing? What's gonna happen to that joint record? Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is go into the settings and show you some things that you might wanna be thinking about before you actually hand this to an operator and take it out to the field and start logging fusions. And I, and I think this is really important, it especially is. for the folks that are on this call, is, is when you're, you get in, you spec this, you get in on, you really need to think about everything that needs to be done beforehand and how to properly do that. So um, that's the, the, everything we're about to walk through is just really important to, to have thought out. And we will be happy to sit down with you, go through all of those best practices um, that before you get a job started. Sure, if you're a new user going data logger and data logger yeah. vault, it would be a good idea to sit down with somebody who really understands and help you get set up so that you're capturing information the way that you want it captured the first time. Instead of having to go back afterwards and try to resort it all out, right. that can become a little bit challenging. So a couple of things we want to look at here. The first thing, let's just go to preferences and see what kind of options we have um, in the data logger software itself. And the first thing I'm seeing here is I can change the language. So we've got a couple of different languages we can, we can switch between. Okay, Spanish and Russian for now. These are things that we can add later if we need to add more languages for a, a job that's happening in a certain part of the world, that can be done. These are some, some of the common ones that we see now. Okay, the next thing we look at is require photos. So I have the option here to decide if I wanna require the operator to add setup photos and completion photos, which would be complete setup photos would be before the fusion joints created, completion photos is the finished product. If you click those or change those to yes, that's going to require the operator to take at least one picture before creating the fusion. And then completion will not let me finish the record until I've entered at least one photo. Now we have some, some suggestions on what those photos should be. And I want to talk more about that when we get a little bit further into the fusion process. Again, these are things you want to think about beforehand. Those photos are a great way to capture some of the information that, that the logging process itself doesn't capture. So am I supposed to take a picture with my iPhone and then email it to myself or how do I get it onto the, the data logger? No, good, good point, Peter. And there is a camera built in to the data logger, just like uh, every other device or tablet that you have now. Uh, what's the megapixel rating on it? 16 megapixels. 16, it's a really good camera and you can get some really good high quality images of certain parts of process like face-offs, pipe alignment, finished bead, things like that. And that's built into the tablet. So I'd take it out of the mount, point it at what I want to take a picture of, take a picture. And I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. Okay. Um, next thing I look at here is extended job details. Uh, this is a feature that's been added so that you can add additional details about the job into the record that you're creating. So um, some of the specifics uh, that weren't initially added into those joint records the by request, we've given you basically some, some free form type fields that we can add in whatever detail we want to put into. Joint retention, okay. save aborted joints, yes or no. This is a really important one. If anywhere throughout a fusion process, I have a problem or I notice you know, something's going wrong and I'm going to start over. I'm going to abort that fusion joint and reset everything up and do it again. What do I want to have happen with that record that I aborted? Do I want that to become a, a permanent record that that happened? So uh, I can start to build some metrics on how many failures we're having, um, you know, how many process failures we're having, what were those, where did I have a contamination problem, did I do a shift sequence incorrectly, whatever that is. We can either choose to save that, and make it permanent record, put it in the vault, or we can pretend like it never happened and it disappears forever. Um, and it's up, to, it's up to you, the people who are planning this, to decide what you want to happen with that. Right. So um, yes, keeps them. No, never happened. Okay. The next thing I look at is some, some, uh, some specifics about what units of measure and, and heater temperatures that I want to add in. So I can switch between you know, PSI. If I'm working in a different part of the world, I can switch to whatever I need it to be. Heater temperatures, I can decide how many heater temperatures I want the operator to have the opportunity to enter uh, per side of the heater. So I can switch this to one. Maybe I'm working with a smaller heater. I only want one temperature per side. This gives me one place to enter that temperature. I can change the unit of measure if needed. 
um, the setup checklist. Um, if we turn the setup checklist on, uh, this again allows for some, some for free form data entry that an operator would enter things like uh, calibration date of a pyrometer I'm using or anything that is outside of a fusion specification that you want to make sure is captured for that particular job would get entered here. So um, that's a, an, a recent addition in, in our uh, latest software rollout. Um, the last thing we'll look at here is review after fusion. So view joint report is, is selected yes right now. And since that's turned on at the end of my fusion process, I'm gonna have an opportunity to look at that graph and look at the joint report and then make a decision on whether or not I like it. If, if I see something wrong or I've entered information incorrectly and I wanna do it again, that's my chance to do it again. And you know, that's how important that is. Uh, it, something we deal with uh, just almost on a daily basis is we're doing all of this through data logging and having you have the opportunity to, to view that report in field right there standing over the fusion before it goes into the ground. And it's so important to take that step and review it, confirm it before. So that way, six, nine months, a year from now, somebody doesn't finally open the report and say, uh oh, we had a problem. Right. You know, you can solve it right there. And it may have only been, it's maybe it's a 30 minute fix as opposed to, you know, a a catastrophe that they have to go back in and, and deal with. So that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, ideally every fusion operator has at, at least a, a, a basic level of, right. of knowledge so they can look at those things and find the potential big issues. Because right. a few things that really jump out at you. You, know, you also have an opportunity later on through the vault or even just through the tablet for an inspector or somebody you know, with a higher level of understanding to review and really get into the details. I like the operators to at least have the basics. Um, the last button here is confirm joint report. That's an opportunity for the operator to uh, say, yes, I do think this one is good to go or no, I don't like this one, I'm gonna do it again. It's just, a, it's just a confirmation from the operator that says, yep, I checked it, I like it. Okay. Um, I'm gonna switch over at the top of the screen here to where it says file naming. And um, this is something that was added in, um, I don't know, a year ago or so. Um, that allows you to decide what you want the name of that file to be um, so that when it's stored, uh, you can have it in the right order that you want it to be in and it, it's, it are things that are familiar to you. So if I switch this over, I can create a custom uh, name for that file. So when it gets stored on my laptop, I will know exactly what I wanna do to go find it. So. Um, if you look across the bottom of the screen where the, it says example, that's the example that, of, of what the file name would look like based on what I'm entering. So job would be a job name that you selected when building the joint report. The operator would be the operator that entered his name on that joint report. So you're building it out specific to what, what was there instead of just using our normal, sorry, wrong button, our normal format, which is DL7, date, time, and then joint number. Um, so you just have some extra flexibility there. We talked a lot about the vault. That's one of those things that that's our recommended way to store this information. A lot of folks are still putting it into a PDF, storing it as a file on their laptop. And this is what, who that would affect the most. Okay, so I'm gonna click the done button. And we looked over preferences. Um, so the next thing I wanna look at now, uh, I'm gonna go into vault. Okay, now the vault, uh, we've talked about a couple times now is essentially a cloud storage system that allows us to keep all the records that we're creating using the data logger in one place that, that's secure and that's uh, accessible when you need it almost instantaneously when a fusion record is done. We want to log into that vault account and now you're going to go on on the web you're going to go to vault.macroy.com you're going to create that vault account there you create a username and password. And now on my tablet, I'm going to enter that username and password and verify that account. And now everything that is on the tablet, as soon as I have a, sig a Wi-Fi signal is immediately going to go into that record. So if I'm on a job site and I'm running a hotspot, I don't have to worry about any data transfer. It's just happening. Right. Okay, now there's some other ways we can move that manually as well, which we'll look at here in just a second. 
Okay, so I'm verified into that vault account. Okay, um, one last thing to look at here before I go into operators and machines would be system. Okay, there are some things that you can do here um, to help prevent you from losing any data from the data logger. Uh, when it's, if it's only stored on the tablet, um, you have an ability to back up everything that's stored on this tablet. So if this is gonna go in for maintenance or, or maybe um, a recalibration or something of that nature, and you don't wanna lose any of your settings, don't wanna lose any of your, your records, you can back up that data, just back it up to a USB storage device. When you get it back from a repair, restore data, put it back on there. You know, you may not always have connectivity yep. too. So that's important. This is, this is something I hate to say that we've had to learn through experience. Um, but it is the case, either a unit becomes damaged. The memory of this device is on the board of the device. So if that board fails, either gets ran over or something like that happens, you have an you could lose that data. So data redundancy for us became really important. And most notably is just really less about a damaged unit and more about somebody just didn't understand what they were doing. And they thought they had to reset the device every time they used it, they cleared all the data out. So we took steps is when you log a fusion, it actually logs it to the memory of the device and then shipping with all DL sevens going forward, you see down at the bottom that SD card backup. We actually include an SD card in every device and we do redundant automatic backups to that card as well. So if the device does become damaged, you still have that other card um, to access the, your, your, your fusion data. And if somebody goes in and does a factory reset, it's still sitting there on that SD card and you have access to it. But the key is we're trying to make it as safe as we can in the field so you can get it into the vault for real safe storage long-term. And you mentioned factory reset and uh, I wanna talk about that just a little bit too. Um, you see the factory reset option and then the delete joint reports option. Um, factory reset from, from within the, the McElroy data logger software will wipe all your operators, all your machines, all your joint records, all your settings. Delete joint reports will only remove the joint reports. So if you're finishing a job and you don't want to see the joint reports from the last one, you delete the joint reports. Right. The factory reset is a great tool for any of you who might be running a rental fleet. Um, when you add that as part of your check-in, check-out process, do a factory reset so that I don't rent a data logger that you used last week and I still have your information on it. There's a possibility there that, that your information makes it into my vault account or yeah. vice versa. So those are two, two tools that if you're running a rental fleet or if you're buying and selling these things, um, once you start using those. Question for you, fellas. You bet. <clears throat> so Mike, I remember you saying last year that you were very proud of the fact that the McElroy data logger Pre precludes an operator from messing with joint reports and that included deleting them so like if he had if he had, was not following procedure and he realized it three joints later and he wanted to delete them you know looking at this it looks like he could delete those joint reports once a joint report is created um it, the only way that it could be deleted would be for you to delete all the joint reports by hitting this joint report button. So probably not the best idea to try to, to delete a, a joint report that doesn't look right because you're just gonna have to get rid of all of them to do that um, or do a factory reset and then they're all gone. Now, the other thing is once they're in the vault or once they're stored, can't be messed with, can't be deleted. That's, but that's why theoretically, we're so high on. Theoretically, somebody could um, do three bad joints, delete everything in the memory on joint reports and start over and not be discovered unless somebody happened to figure it out. Yeah, they, they, that, yeah there's step, multiple steps there, right? They had right. to not be connected to, to internet data in any way. They had to go delete them. And then they also had to go into that SD card backup and delete them from the SD card backup. Got it. So um, we're putting in multiple steps there. So, so I have a question. Uh, sure. Somebody asked, hey, uh, I think pictures are great, but what about video? Uh, video is something we we will look into. The file packet to send it to the vault gets much bigger. We already 
somewhat struggle with connectivity just in the nature of our business you don't always can't always guarantee it um, to be able to send that big of a file if you think about some of the top users are in the middle of nowhere working on fairly shoddy service so if we made that even bigger it's going to cause issues it is definitely something we can consider if uh, video is is something you're interested in uh, is there a way to look up reports per data logger used so if an operator is using different data loggers for the same job, uh, can an individual or an inspector search a variety of ways to find information? Uh, I would, there's probably two more ways. I would look at that first, the way the most, most common would be, you'd probably look at your operator first, and then you would look at your, um, your, your machine, your actual fusion machine and the vault. As soon as we get into that, we'll actually show you what's there. Um, we have had people ask, can we do it by data logger? So that is something that is actually on the roadmap for the future. So cool. Let's, let's take a quick break here. And I'd like to call up Tom Titus. Hey, Tom, are you there? Can you go uh, video on and audio on i'd like to introduce you to our our audience i'm having a video issue peter to be honest with you i, I am here though sorry about that. awesome well uh greetings so tom titus uh is our sponsor today and he's with united poly systems so tom welcome to the show thank you glad to be a part of it so who is united poly systems and what do you guys do United Poly Systems is an HDPE piping manufacturer that has been in business since 2011, started by a private owners. We have since been acquired by a private equity group in 2019. And we operate out of Springfield, Missouri with one of our facilities and another in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And between the two, we make both pressure piping HDPE systems as well as conduit. Uh, for telecommunications, fiber, a variety of different applications there as well. We make three quarter through 26 inch between 11 lines at our two different facilities. Fantastic. So you guys are making the pipe, you're converting that resin into pipe and you're selling it into multiple markets. Well, we greatly appreciate your sponsoring this and helping us uh, bring this great content to our audience, Tom. So please stay in line. I don't know that we're going to have any pipe questions, but uh, we're very thankful for your support. You got it. Thank you. Okay. See you later, Tom. All right, Mike Pacheco, back to you in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I hope it's warmed up a little bit. Yeah, we're good. We'll, um, so we'll we'll move on. Real, we'll start going a little bit faster here to to get into the process. Settings is the fun stuff. All right. So <laughs> right. No, it's, it's important though. So yeah. let's go ahead and look at what it takes to set up to go ahead and do a, a fusion. So I'm going to hit this big green start button. Okay, and I've already entered a bunch of information here. All right, I'm going to tell it. What process am I doing? I'm doing pipe fusion. I have the option to tell it a pressure test. That's something else that we can use the data logger for now too. That's more building out. We talk about that value. You talk about you can do in-field pressure test with the data logger. We have a we have the transducer, so you would connect to just like you would connect a, a, a gauge. You can connect this and actually test that that uh, that line that you've just fused. So pretty important, but we're that's a diversion and just just from pipe fusion. Yep. So next thing I'm gonna look at is joint ID. It's gonna start off at one. It's gonna count up every time I make a fusion unless I tell it to stop. Yep. So that's another thing you wanna think about. Do I wanna start over at one every day? Do I wanna go from one to whatever for the entire project? It's a decision that needs to be made beforehand. The job name, this is another one that's important. This is the way, one of the ways that data is gonna be sorted in the vault. So the job name needs to be consistent, especially if you're running multiple data loggers. If you spell, one a little bit different than the other or add a space or anything like that it's going to make two job names you can fix that later it's easier if you get it right on the data entry here operator i'm going to create an operator so i've added myself here as an operator um, i can add multiple operators and they would then be stored in the data logger so if you have a crew five people they can all have a profile if you will here and when they go to use this data logger they just select themselves and all their information is already there same thing with the equipment. So I'm gonna click on machine. You can see I've got my Acrobat that I'm using there. Same thing, I can add a whole library. If you own a fleet of equipment, you can add them all into your data logger and they're stored there. So you just select the one that you're using that day. Okay, I'm gonna hit the next button here and go to our next screen. As you can see, as I go through these screens, this is that guided workflow. This is where it's helping me set this up so that I'm capturing the right, the right data. What type of fusion am I doing? Okay, these are the options that you have. 
sidewall miter dual contain. I'm gonna leave it on butt fusion. That's what we're gonna do today. I have, what specification am I using? I've got F2620-20 in here. I have a whole list of other specifications that we could choose from. Okay, I'm gonna leave it on F2620 for now. Okay, I'm gonna hit the next button. Now this is where we take pictures. Okay, so if setup photos are required, I can't get past this screen without taking a setup photo. So what I like to recommend here is that you have your fusion equipment set up, you have your pipe set up, you have pipe installed in the machine, go ahead and do that face off on those pipe ends, get everything cleaned up and aligned and start taking pictures because the logging process doesn't capture any of that, right? Photos is the way that you capture that. You can put as many pictures in here as you want. You can take a picture of what your pipe stand setup looks like. I often you, say you're trying to tell the story of yes. what was going on in field. So alignment setup photos, if you are feeding this back to an inspector or, a, you know, I don't know, a project engineer, you want to tell that story and say, there it is. There's no question that I am aligned properly. Right. Somebody asked the question, how does the camera work? I'm going to hit this plus button. It's stuck in the mount right now. So you're looking at the floor, but I'm going to turn the camera around and you'll see me. So that's your camera. When I get ready to take a picture, I'm going to aim it at whatever I want to take a picture at and then attach that. And now this is part of my permanent record. Yep. So um, alignment, Job faced off pipe ends, faced off to the stops, um, any of those requirements that that logging process isn't going to capture, photos is the way to do that. Yep. Um, the amount of information you can get through these pictures is, um, is, a, is really never ending. We keep thinking of new, new things to take pictures of. Okay. I'm also going to capture weather conditions. We're working inside today doing a demo, so it's nice and warm in here. We're indoors. Okay. These are things that could impact the process that is done, you know, based on, uh, you know, a cool time being longer or shorter or having to heat pipe longer to get bead sizes. This helps give the inspector or the person who's reviewing this information a, a better window into what was going on that day when that fusion was made. So we want to keep updating this throughout the day, even as temperatures change, like you said, as we're getting 40 degrees temperature swing changes. Yeah. Process might look a little different at three o'clock in the afternoon than it did at six o'clock this morning. So um, this is how we capture that information. Okay, and we're gonna enter our pipe size. So here I've got our pipe size entered already. If I wanna change it, I just tell it what pipe size I have. I can switch it between ips, dips, whatever that is. I'm gonna save that. Okay. There's also this traceability button underneath that. Um, if you have a barcoded pipe, I can take my data logger out of the mount hit the traceability button and you're gonna get a little green laser scanner that you can scan that barcode. That's gonna pull in all the information about that pipe, more than what you're gonna get with manual entry. What you're gonna get with manual entry is what you see on the screen. Size, DR, what kind of pipe material is it? And what are we fusing, stick to stick? Is it a fitting? That's what that fuse to button is. With the, with the scanner, you're gonna get data manufacturer, you're gonna get all sorts of information about yeah. that run of pipe. Okay, we'll go to next. Now, this is where we actually start setting up our equipment to do the fusion. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna measure my drag. I can change my interfacial pressure here if I want. This is what's gonna start to calculate how much pressure I'm gonna use to do the fusion. So we've already captured what the pipe size is. We already know what the standard is. Now we're gonna measure that drag and that's that final piece that we need to figure out what our fusion pressure is gonna be. And, and the standard we chose, F2620 here, the, the interfacial pressure that's targeting the middle, but that all of this is going to change dependent on the standard you've chosen. So it's already right. plugged in for you, ready to go. And it's gonna make that calculation, I mean, as, as easy as possible. Right, yeah. I just turned on my, my Acrobat here. So I've already measured the drag on this. I'm gonna, that's where it's set at 21. That's the drag pressure I've got. Just to, to prove it, I'll show you on the screen here. It's gonna be around at 20 mark. So if it, whatever my drag is, I hit the measure drag button and it's gonna capture that number. So if I hit that, that's gonna be 20 to 21 PSI. That's now locked in. It's gonna get added to the calculation for me. Okay. Then I get this opportunity to pre prepare the machine. This is where I'm gonna set my fusion pressure. That's the bead, that's the fuse cool. 
All right now the drag's already added to that. So I need to put 315 PSI. I'm gonna move my selector to the fusion position and I am going to turn the PR valve up just like we always do until we get to the number that we're looking for. And this is really the day, if you're, if you're ever using our, the Mac or the McCalc app, here is exactly what McCalc is doing, but you're, you're, you're working into the machine here, setting up the process, but it just gave you that 315. And once you get that, you know, your pipe size, you know, your standard, you know, your, uh, uh, your interfacial pressure and the drag and you're good to go. So. Yeah, and as, as a trainer, I'm sure there's trainers listening to this. We spent a lot of time trying to teach people to look at the standard and do the math and try to figure these numbers out based on the equipment that you have and all the variables. I didn't have to think about this. Yep. I just put the information in and it's done. Now that entry has got to be correct. So we need to, when you still need to train on that, make sure people understand what's supposed to go here. Um, once they understand that, it's easy. Okay, hit the next button. Okay, now I can enter those heater temperatures. This is where I selected I only want one. Okay, I'm just gonna enter something that, that, that doesn't look right. It, or uh, that's not the right number. Let's go a little too high for the standard we're using. It's gonna tell me that's too high. Yep. It turns red, I don't like that number. Now, if I switch to something that is within the standard, it's gonna say, okay, that's good. I like that number, let's move on. And now I have my heater temperature captured. Now that is a, ma that is a manual measurement. The data logger doesn't, doesn't measure it. You have to measure it and enter that number. So you still have the, the flexibility to use whatever type of measuring device that you want. And now I'm ready to perform this fusion. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and let you see what this screen looks like as we um, do that. The, to, to start this process, I'm gonna hit the start fusion button. Okay, and you're gonna see that I'm starting to develop this graph. This looks similar to the video that Mike showed you a few minutes ago. First thing in the process we're gonna do is a beat up. So we're gonna close the pipe ends onto the heater. And you immediately see that pressure jump up to the predetermined number that we just dialed in, set up. That's our beat up process. When we're ready to do our shift sequence, we'll perform that and you'll see in real time what's happening is that pressure is gonna drop and it's gonna drop down to the drag pressure that I had selected and we shift into neutral. So this is the, the great thing about six and now seven is that I have live feedback as an operator. If I don't like the way this looks right now, I can stop, hit that abort button and I don't waste any time going through this whole process um, only to find out that I've got to back up and redo it. So huge time saver um, and then great initial you know, immediate feedback on what's going on here. When I get ready to, to fuse the pipe, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do an open and close here. So I'm gonna open the carriage, pull the heater, close the pipe ends together, make that fusion. And it's gonna look something like this. So this is still being built out in real time. Um, I have a timer that I can reset here in the top right corner of the screen. I'll reset it again in case you missed that. And that is a way for me to keep track of that cool time. So. Um, I can manually reset that as many times as I need. Doesn't affect the, oh, what the overall joint report's gonna look like. Um, it's just a tool for the operator to keep track of that number. And you can see that everything the operator needs is posted right across the top of that screen. So all those numbers were there. We wait the cool time and then we hit the done button. Yes, and now that joint report goes straight into the vault. Um, I have an opportunity to add any notes about anything that, that was going on that I wanna make sure an inspector knows about and then take those completion photos, finished bead, final location where it's gonna, gonna go into the ground or be buried. Okay. And then I can review everything from here. So this is that opportunity to review. Quick question so before you review. Okay. So I have a question. Um, so I'm using a pyrometer to measure the temperature of that heater plate. Um, does the ambient temperature or the distance from my pyrometer to the heater plate affect the reading at all? Or because it's an infrared and very cool uh, distance and ambient temperature yeah, doesn't matter. If you're using the infrared style pyrometers, they are accurate, but there is some variability between the different styles. So you just need to know what you have and understand how it's supposed to be used. We see a lot, you know, operators have an infrared and they kind of just shoot it, whatever angle, whatever distance, well, that's the number they, they get there's gonna be some variability there. They're usually supposed to be a certain distance away at a certain angle 
they're usually adjustable for the, the color of the, of the thing that you're taking the temperature of. So all those settings need to be adjusted right and keep it consistent and, and you'll be fine with an infrared pyrometer. Okay, thank you. You bet. So real quick review here, front end plot shows me the bead up and the heat soak. Open and close, the red box is the amount of time that I had. Those pressure changes between tell me that my pipe was opened off the heater and infused within the amount of time that I had based on F2620. And then the summary plot shows me the entire process. The blue would be the cool. Now I cut this off for the sake of time here, but we would wanna see that yellow line go all the way out the back of the blue box. Now it would indicate that I had a proper cool on this fusion. Any photos that I took are gonna be right there at the very end. After I've reviewed all this, I hit next. And now that joint report is in my vault account and Mike's my inspector and he can take a look at it. So Absolutely. I think the next thing we wanna to try to look at is what, what does that look like now that it's in the vault? Right, yep. And, and that is, so the data logger, great infield collector, right? That's the whole point. It's easy, easy to use. It, it keeps the operators consistent. Now, uh, yeah, let's hop into the vault. That's where the real power of all this uh, comes from. So I'm gonna stop that uh, data logger screen share and I'm gonna jump back uh into a vault account all right while you're doing that i'm gonna i'm gonna run a poll um so uh can you see that poll on your screen and it says this poll only applies to utilities contractors and engineers uh, so if you're in the industry don't respond i've used polyethylene at least once on a project so i'm trying to get a couple hundred of you out there today I'm trying to get an indicator of how experienced is this group. So in the future, I can uh, adjust uh, our content here at the PE Alliance accordingly. So thank you for answering that. I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds, Mike. So, um, and Mike, we've got uh, about seven more minutes till we end um, the show today, because we're gonna try to end right at um, a quarter after. Yep. Um, awesome, so we have a pretty experienced group in the audience today and here are the results so 92 percent of the people in the audience mike have um, some experience with um, polyethylene so uh, i'm going to ask one more question um, i don't know how to get to number two all right mike take it away okay so i had to move this out of my way Okay, so now we're into the vault. So it real easy, vault.macroy.com, create a user login. Um, we can talk more about best practices and things to do there. So feel free to contact us. But what I wanna show you here, this is a, a real user. This is a company, Fusion Technologies. I mentioned to them earlier as one of our testers, they give me access to their account. Um, it's, it's very anonymized. So it's, it makes for a really good account. This is a real, operation, I mean, a high, high volume, they have over 80,000 fusions in the in the vault. And you can see, this is what you're going to get when you log in all of that report, that report that Jesse just just finished would fire off and be here. And now we've sorted it. So that's also something that's important is, is that we've done the sorting for you. So you don't have to think about file structures and how to manage all of that. The vault is going to handle that for you. So it does it by pivoting on certain data aspects. So here, that job name is so important. So whether it be a work order name or however you're approaching that job name, you want all of that data to be funneled together. That's why it's important to enter that correctly in the data logger itself. And, and in here, they use project, uh, project numbers. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, and then we go into this tile format and each of these tiles, there's the job name, or in this case, a project number. This particular one was updated three days ago. Um, and matter of fact, these guys are down in West, West Texas, uh, frozen out right living now. Life. Yeah, living life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and then they 505 reports uh, on this particular job. Uh, I'm going to go in and look at this job. This was updated 16 days ago, 168 reports so when i click into that now my data this is all of the fusion records down here below of that particular job so i have 168 reports started on the 27th finished on the second they ran one machine two different operators so i have all this high level detail then i can go in and look at the date and the time um, the id the joints the machine they were using the operator um, but what is really important here 
it, when you when you're we're working with an operator like this, 500 fusions on that other job, 168. If you're an inspector or you're a manager, you're a project engineer, trying to review all of these is a daunting task. So what we've done is we've built in what we call exception reporting, right? I want to manage this by exception. Show me what's what outside of the standard. That's what I want to go look at first. <clears throat> so for what we've done is we've checked all of these fusions against the fusion standard and anything that would be outside of that standard would get into a for review pile. Anything within would go into an auto accept and we McElroy, the, the vault never rejects anything. That is all, all uh, up to the user. And so there you can see they've rejected three of their own but 165 and they have no for review. And when you click on one of these, you can now go in and see everything that's here. So you see that checklist, this is exception reporting telling you the soak is good, the open close is good, the temperatures that were recorded were within spec, the unit is calibrated within the right proper calibration date. And in this particular case, the fuse is outside and, and it oh, looks like they had a little issue out here on the graph. So I didn't have to go, uh, let me get that off screen here. Um, so I didn't have to go and, and you know, scroll through every detail of this report and identify any issues. I quickly came over here, saw this, and I looked down right here. There happened to be in a, a fast fusion machine. They bumped the front boom and it hit the pipe, caused the pressure spike, probably lasted less than a second. And they say, fusion's okay. The operator made that in field. That is just a great example of what's going on and what communication they can have. So the inspector back, back in the office can say, oh, okay, I know what happened. I flip it over to accept, I'm good to go, I move on. And they can go and quickly look over onto the next joint and pull that up. Crazy so as this is, the operator from that uh, is on this call right now, Mike, and he said, would you please talk about tags Ah, oh, tagging. Yeah, tagging is a is 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 another key. So let's say that you have something. You know, you were doing a. Uh, you know, we used to get a lot of people uh, when they were doing a tie-in. They wanted a tie-in to be uh, uh, tagged, so they would actually create a tag. And here you can go in. You can see all of their tags, and then this gives you basically a customized way to fil filter and sort all of your additional fusion data. So that's, that's one of those key features. You can actually see they do have a tie-in, a milestone, uh, it's a sidewall, it's a pressure test, it's an operator OQ, which is exactly what- I, I use this for training, yep. for training inspectors, so I can have examples of, of anomalies that I can pull up quickly and show too. So there's yep. a ton of variability or a ton of flexibility yep. with, with tags. And you can download the reports, you can create PDFs, you can share them with colleagues through the vault, uh, through PDFs, anything like that, create additional notes. You have all of the reporting data that we collected in, in the data logger itself. You do have fusion location, so map overlay. And that'll take me to my last point I'll just talk about. We also have built in, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here. <clears throat> We also have a, a built-in GIS portal. So if you're using GIS and you want that uh, GPS information in your GIS, we have a portal um, built in through the vault so you can import all that, create as built uh, in the field and hopefully uh, make your life a little easier from that perspective. That was a very fast run through of the vault and the power that it has, uh, but Jesse did a great job uh, with the data logger. So I think, yeah, we're, we're open for questions. You guys did a great job. Uh, but Jesse, I'm interested in, you know, now that you've been doing this for so many years with uh, really a powerful six and seven day logger product, uh, what are the, what's the one or two most important things that you think an owner should know about putting it in a spec? I mean, is it that you have to train the inspector? Um, I mean, what is it that you see that a municipal water utility really ought to know about this great product? Yeah, understanding those things we talked about at the very beginning. What do you want to happen with your data? How are you going to sort it? Who's, who needs to have it? You've got to make those decisions on the front end or else you wind up with fragmented data. It's all over the place. It's hard to find. Nobody really knows what to do with it. Yeah, you that's, want a clean vault. That's, like we that's just that's showed you one. with Fusion Technologies. It's a then, really clean setup. And then you, you hit it on the head too with the inspectors. You've got to have inspectors who understand how to interpret these things. If you have inspectors who don't understand how to interpret this and you mm -hmm. spec it on a job, you're going to create issues where 
you're, you're having to you know, do a deep dive and, and spend time talking with the experts at McElroy or wherever um, to figure these things out. So you need somebody on site who really understands how to interpret the, the data. Very cool. Um, well, we're going to be on uh, St. Patty's Day. We're going to be there in Tulsa with you guys for a long format um, iSeries and all your products. We're not going to spend too much time on your product, Mike, the data logger, because uh, we're doing this show, but we're yeah. going to talk about uh, all the other products. I'm very impressed with this. You know, I used to say for years that, you know, I love the data logger because um, we know that if you can't figure out how to use the data logger, you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing fusion because it's really that easy to use, but you guys have really elevated it to a new level, you know, to a level where this data is really usable. You can make it compatible with GIS. You know, I mean, it's really extraordinary. I'm very impressed. Uh, I know our audience is too. We hardly lost anybody from the start of this show. So hopefully you guys, you two guys will come back and do this show again uh, toward the end of the year. Maybe we'll do this twice a year. So, um, you can reach me at pdike at pepipe.org. If you want a copy of the engineer's package or a PDF of this presentation, email Drew Mueller at D Mueller, M U E L L E R, at pepipe.org. So, thank you all, and hopefully, we'll see you again next week. Great job, McElroy. Mike and Jesse, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Peter. All right. Thanks, Peter.